I can't believe I forgot my name. She almost took it from me. If you completely forget it, you'll never find your way home. I've tried everything to remember mine. You can't remember your name? No. But for some reason I remembered yours. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rolaine. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. And we are at our last regular episode for 2020. We are at episode 147 today. Back to Erica's choice. What are we talking about? Something wonderful. And that is Spirited Away from 2001, written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki. The Japanese cast included Rumi Hiragi, Miyu Urino, and Mari Natsuki. The English cast included Davy Chase, Jason Marsden, and Suzanne Plachette. It's about Chihiro, a 10-year-old girl who, while moving to a new neighborhood, enters the world of kami, or the spirits, from Shinto and Buddhist folklore. She's exploring an abandoned theme park, and her parents are turned into pigs by the witch Yubaba. So Chihiro takes a job in Yubaba's bathhouse as she works to figure out how to free herself and her parents and return to her own world. That's a lot going on. No <laughs> when you kidding. Read it that way. And you definitely feel it. Now, this is pretty universally beloved. I feel safe in saying it became the most successful film in Japanese history, and it won the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature. Now, before we get into the film, I want to talk about a couple of things to give us some context here. First and foremost, Studio Ghibli. Now, crazily enough, I had heard of them, but I hadn't ever watched any of the films until I met you. So thank you. Do you remember what drew you to Studio Ghibli in the first place? A couple of things. I've always loved animated films. I'm always on the lookout for something new and exciting in that vein. And two, Japanese animation in particular has always been with me. It started with Gachamon, which I knew then as Battle of the Planets. When I was around seven or eight, when it was in syndication and on right after school every day, I rushed home to watch this show. It was thrilling. How did I miss all of that? You were, again, five years younger than me, so there may have been a gap in the syndication packages, but we have the complete Gatchamon set on the shelf here so we can watch it anytime you want. I do regret we were not able to go to Studio Ghibli when we went to Japan. Hopefully, someday we will. But because of things like that, in my youth, I was aware of the massive market for Japanese animation from a young age. But even with that, though, I was kind of like you. I wasn't in on the ground floor with Studio Ghibli. I somehow missed a lot of that until relatively late into the studio's career. With Ghibli, I think my story is like a lot of people in the U.S. I first became aware of them when Princess Mononoke burst on the scene in the States, and like a lot of people probably did, once I knew about them, I devoured everything that was available, working backwards in the catalog and then seeing each new thing. And you say it was the most successful film in Japanese history. I was also slowly at that time, I think, realizing how immense and important they were. Globally, I don't think there is a bigger name in animation outside of Disney, probably. Do you remember the first Studio Ghibli film I showed you? I'm pretty sure it was this one, and I think that was a great place to start. Do you feel like it was a game changer in terms of your appreciation of animation? Yes, definitely a game changer, especially because I had pretty limited experience with non-American animation. Well then, are you also like me and you're in the Studio Ghibli can do no wrong camp at this point? I don't know how you could not be. I mean, they haven't done anything yet that seems to be some sort of grave artistic failure or revealed themselves to be total monsters. So yeah, I think they're pretty fantastic. 
Well, I think looking at the whole catalog, My Neighbor Totoro is my absolute favorite. Do you favor one or two in particular? I do think it's Kiki's delivery service, though those are two really difficult choices to make between fantastic films. I think if I had seen Kiki's when I was a kid, I would have been on that animation train forever. Yeah, there would be no way to dislodge that as your favorite of all time. Absolutely, because the Disney stuff I grew up with was just different, and I don't think inspires that same love and connection for kids, I would say, who then become adults. Let's talk about Miyazaki in particular. This film, truly to my mind, represents one person's whole vision. Writing, directing, producing, drawing, influencing the music, it just goes on and on. What does he mean to you, since you are the first one to find him of the two of us? He's just a true, complete artist through and through, which I think is invaluable. The thing that I find so impressive about it, well, there are multiple things probably, but I'll mention two that really affect me the most. For someone with such an idiosyncratic voice and style and such a defined set of core themes, it's nearly magical to take that and turn it into something that is so universally felt and understood and beloved. And then work ethic is the other thing. You cannot keep him down. I don't think he will ever be able to stay fully retired, quote unquote. And that drive to create, it's just something you don't turn off. Here's what's so insane to me is that with Spirited Away, and I believe this is a trend for him as well, he doesn't start his films with a script. It develops as he goes, and that comes from the drawings. He starts with the storyboards and determines where the script needs to go. He says the characters come to life and tell him that. He said, the film makes itself, and I have no choice but to follow. That's pretty wonderful. Now, something that is kind of debatable here. We watched the English dub version of the film. So would you say for these Ghibli films and other foreign language animation, do you have a particular stance one way or the other, dub or subtitles? Well, we were lucky enough to see this together that first time in the theater. So we watched the subtitled version on the big screen. And then for this recent viewing here at home, just to contrast it, we watched it with the dubbed English voices. So we've had both experiences. And I have to say, typically, I am subtitles all the way. The only dubbed films I usually prefer are because they add an extra layer of enjoyment. They're frequently exaggerated, stuff like kung fu films or Italian crime pictures, where the manner and the style of speech is sometimes unintentionally funny or really exaggerated and pointed, so it makes it different than if you were watching it the other way. Now, I know that there are viewers that dubbing is very helpful for. They may have vision or other issues that make subtitles hard to process, and that's great for them, but in my case, it would just be not wanting to have to read and to me, that's not a good enough reason. I prefer to have the experience that is as close to how it was originally intended as possible. So that includes language and voices. So subtitles are always my first choice. Well, it's definitely not a hill I'm prepared to die on. I say whatever makes the most sense for you. I did like it in this instance because I could just focus on the visuals mm. this time, especially as we're trying to take notes. It's helpful for that reason. I would say the big con for me is occasionally that disconnect when you realize you're hearing words come out with American mouths that just doesn't quite feel the same. I did realize as I was searching for the scene, this is going to be my next experiment in watching the film with the sound off. Now, I know you love to do that so you can concentrate on the actual artwork, but what is it this time that made you specifically feel that way? It was watching Haku and Chihiro come through that bit of the forest and the garden path, and I'm looking at the flowers in a way that I realized I hadn't before. With that, are you ready to get into the film? Absolutely. So we're starting right away with a move to a new town, and I can definitely relate to that. This is an adventure that Chihiro is just not feeling at this point. And as we're first meeting her, she's this 10-year-old girl... And if you start to read more about her, I think what I would term as mostly male critics tend to characterize her as sullen or spoiled, and they then track her journey from that standpoint. Do you think that's a fair characterization of Chihiro? 
I do, but I think I may be coming at it from a slightly different angle. I think of it as solely an age or maturity thing. I don't think of it as being gender specific. We get the same energy from Paul Rudd in Wet Hot American Summer, for instance. <laughs> She's being a little petulant, but it is completely understandable based upon the circumstances that you outline here. She's not feeling the new home and being uprooted at this age and having to go to a new place. Her parents, they're encouraging her to embrace the adventure, but it seems to me that they have forgotten a little bit what this might have been like for them at that age. Obviously, they have to provide instruction and guidance, but that needs to be softened a little bit by remembering how this was when you went through it. Because I think encouraging is not the actual word. They're basically demanding <laughs> that she go with the adventure. So I can appreciate when she says, this is depressing. It is. Now, this is something that I, for better or worse, never really had to do. But based upon what you're saying, you did. So how intensely were you relating to what she's going through with that, with a new home, with a new school? Well, I connected to it and her right away. That's where I was when I was 13 going on 14. I was miserable. We moved from Virginia to Idaho, and that was leaving not only my friends, but also my family. All the rest of my family were still in Virginia, and it was depressing. I'm also an only child, so it was really just sort of me going through it. That was the other thing I was going to ask you about, because Miyazaki, he often has central figures that are only children in almost all of his films, now that I think of it. And so I was guessing you relate to that, too. But what part of it is that? Is it they can afford to be wrapped up in the magic of their own story or they appreciate the great responsibility of being the only one that can set things right in this adventure? What are you connecting to there? I would say it's a little bit more of nobody understands me but me. <laughs> That's what I would say. Because I, yeah, yeah okay. I did. I was, I was sullen and I made everybody's lives a living hell. And I'm sorry to everyone who's not listening because my mom doesn't know what a podcast is still. But anyway, you know, normally I don't, in every instance in film, connect to children. But there are these just larger themes in this film that I think have something to say to all of us. So even if you're not watching a version of yourself, the stories are just transcendent. And that's before we even get to the beauty of the art. Now, Miyazaki said that he specifically created this about a 10-year-old girl and for the same audience. So we can look at Spirited Away in a number of respects as an example of what's called shoujo anime. That's young girl. And in general, there's a lot of manga and a lot of anime that's targeted at specific audiences. Yeah, Chihiro is in a tough in-between kind of place in her life. And I love these little nuances and differences that we discover when we explore other cultures. Because there's not a real equivalent in terms of the space that young women and girls occupy in Japanese pop culture versus American. And you see it in everything from choices as benign and heartwarming as this to things as bonkers as house. They're often at an age where they're quote unquote cute, but there's no overt sexuality to that persona. And they'll frequently be costumed in ways that underline their age. And being girls instead of grown women, they aren't as potentially threatening or intimidating to some people. So I think it removes a certain specific set of considerations. And without that hurdle, there are segments of the audience, whatever their motivation may be, that find it easier to identify with her because of that. They can align themselves with her and see her as a hero, whereas they might not be able to if this character was a little older. Not a girl, not yet a woman, as Britney Spears would say. <laughs> but yes, and Miyazaki created her to be somebody that the 10-year-old girls in his life could look up to, which I think is a worthy goal. So let's talk about this adventure beginning. We're moving from one world to the next. We see all of these little shrines everywhere, and the family follows this old path through the old theme park. And as they begin stuffing themselves, her parents are then later turned into pigs. That's when Chihiro is drawn towards the beautiful bathhouse that we begin to see. By the way, I would go into in a heartbeat. 
she immediately makes a connection with a boy, Haku, who basically gives her the lay of the land, the rules that she needs to follow to be safe in this world. So even just a few minutes in, we're starting to get a glimpse of the enormity of this new world. So in this film, this was the first time that Ghibli used both computer animation and hand-drawn animation, which was their background. How do you feel about that as a big fan? Well, I like all types of animations. Just like a typewriter, a computer is just a tool. It all depends on how you use it. There will always be purists and Luddites. And to be honest, I probably have an affinity for certain things that represent an older, more archaic way of doing things. That's just my personal preference. But you can have an appreciation for both. I don't think that is a problem. And I certainly don't feel cheated when I look at the screen. It's all so beautiful and inviting. And you have this abandoned theme park, the bat house, the train, when she first meets a person other than her parents. It feels more in line with traditional, in some cases, ages old storytelling. So I'm not even feeling a hint of advanced animation technology. I'm thinking more of things like Alice in Wonderland parallels while I'm watching it. We are through the looking glass. There is an eat me moment with a piece of food as protection. Then there are touches of Narnia and the Wizard of Oz. It's just so much a world that I want to live in. I'm not overly concerned with whether or not it had a computer assist. I'm loving it too, because it doesn't get into that realm of uncanny valley, mm -hmm. which you see in a lot of modern animation that I still sometimes have difficulty with. It also helps that the storytelling is so on point. I feel like her characterization is so consistent and complete throughout. Just like her being upset at being uprooted without much consideration, her response to everything else that she's encountering now is reasonable because it's all so overwhelming. And she's overcoming fears, which is not necessarily easy. And by the time she's reached the bowels of the boiler, she's become part of a literary tradition that is centuries old. Because everyone from Dante to the Steve Miller band knows that you've got to go through hell before you get to heaven. I just love the aspect of doing things that you never thought you could have done even five minutes before. So we're getting into super fun bits here. We're meeting all of the different spirits. She's getting a job and she's on her own so quickly. So by the way, I want to live in my own compartment, just like the Boilerman and like Harry Potter, basically. I love exploring the bathhouse world, meeting all of the different kami there who have come to replenish and rejuvenate. This is all about the solstice rituals here. This is when villagers typically call forth their local kami and invite them into their baths, which is speaking my language. Miyazaki had said that in his grandparents' time, people just believed that kami existed everywhere. And I love that we see the representation of so many different spirits. Did you have a favorite? Well, I love these little soot guys. The sound of that coal clacking together is so pleasing to my ear. And then No Face obviously has to be a contender, but I think that's more because of the effect that Chihiro has on him, not necessarily for his own individual merits. So my favorite, just based upon their own individual vibe, has to be the Radish Spirit in his bathhouse outfit and his cool sake bowl hat. He seems to be a little menacing at first, but... It turns out he's just playing it cool, and in his understated way, he actually helps out at a crucial moment. Well, you stole both of mine, so <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah, I love the daikon. He is really speaking to me by Porky Pigging it all over that joint, <laughs> invading everyone's personal space with his butt. I'm totally into that. And yes, I love the black soots. Those are Susuwatari, by the way. Could you have imagined that these little circles with legs and some eyes would have so much personality? We're about to meet someone else really significant here. Yubaba, the head witch of the bathhouse and her giant baby. Yubaba grudgingly gives Chihiro the job. She instructs Chihiro that you must work without complaint or you're going to be turned into a pig too. I like to feel that Chihiro's insistence on having a job is kind of an autobiographical note by Miyazaki. I feel like he's injecting a little bit of himself into that character. That work ethic mm -hmm. that you mentioned earlier. The other big thing here is that Yubaba changes Chihiro's name to Sin. 
Now, there's a lot of significance around names and the taking of the name, at least to me. Do you see this as a loss of identity? That's kind of where I'm coming down. Or do you see something else in that ritual? I see two things. The power of a name is obviously very substantial in this story. If you lose it completely, you will never get home, as illustrated by our opening scene. But I'm questioning one thing or the other. Is it more about individual identity, or is it more about the strength and heritage and your lineage? Your own name and reputation versus guarding and preserving the family name. And I think this is another one of those interesting cultural differences with my perception being that American viewers are probably more inclined to think of their own name and identity first rather than maybe Japanese viewers that might take a longer view. I know that's definitely where I realized I was coming from. But for Chihiro, I read it as a mix of the two, but with the heavier emphasis definitely being on establishing and maintaining her own identity, which is the crux of the matter of this whole story. And it's part of that larger theme here that I see of divisions falling more along generational lines than anything else. So Chihiro's name means basically a thousand and searching or seeking or asking questions. And when she's reduced down to sin, that means just a thousand. And to me, again, that Western lens, I start to think about you're just one face in a crowd. Well, I don't think that's particularly unique to Western culture, because I think of the salaryman culture and how vast and faceless that feels like when I really consider it, and how many of those guys go missing every year and no one notices. All kinds of things go into that, that I don't think it's necessarily maybe that different in that regard. It also, again, from my Western perspective, makes me think about the idea of changing the name of an immigrant. So someone is coming into your world, and you've render their name into something else. It's interesting, though, because it does force her to really assume a level of adulthood or greater teenagehood, essentially, than she was certainly ready to when she entered the theme park. And speaking of Western, Yubaba looks different than everybody else there. She is in Western dress. She is definitely eyeing her jewels, and there definitely seems to be a money aspect to her life that we haven't seen for anybody else. We saw Chihiro's parents turn into pigs, and so this is one of those examples of Miyazaki going back to a theme that really speaks to him, consumerism and greed. Is this a theme that speaks to you in any sort of a specific way? Oh, definitely. But let me say first, I love you, Baba. And at least a little bit of that is how much she conjures up the Baba Yaga folktale tradition for me. This ambivalent but capricious witchiness and the way that she oversees the boundary between the living and the spirit world and by extension the metaphor the boundary between youth and adulthood. But especially in the way that she does something that I think you just referred to a little bit. She functions to put our protagonist through trials. And in a way you could say that without Yubaba Chihiro doesn't fully mature. But you're right about the other stuff, too. Socioeconomics are definitely in there. Class issues, too, because there's an example where we hear them say, cleaning the big tub, that's frog work, quote unquote. And so much of the action here hinges upon literal consumption. Her parents gorge themselves and turn themselves into pigs. And Chihiro's reticence in that case actually works to protect her. And then how do they not see the inherent danger of no face constantly eating things and growing larger and larger, but they overlook it because they are blinded by the prospect of potential wealth? Well, Miyazaki was talking about a pretty specific application of this theme, the Japanese culture of the 80s, though here in the West, we were certainly going through the go-go 80s as well. It just doesn't seem quite as poignant to me as it might to someone else because I grew up without money. I still don't have much money. So I wasn't partaking of that culture. At this point, Chihiro is definitely ensconced in this world. She's working, but she still has the connection with Haku and he helps her sort of formulate her escape plan. And at the very least, maintaining her clothes and her shoes and reminding her to maintain her name. At this point in the film, were you at all concerned about her escape plan? And 
I'm going to mention Western Lens again. Did you ever feel like there was a possibility for a romantic relationship between Haku and Chihiro or Sen? Well, you're on vacation at the boardwalk and you meet a mysterious boy who might be a dragon. Isn't this every girl's dream? Basically, you get some ice cream, you play some skee ball, you get airbrushed t-shirts with your name on them. Your first kiss. But to answer your first question, I was not concerned about her escape plan ultimately because I know how these Ghibli stories have to play out. Yeah, you know me, I'm on the edge of my seat the whole time, even though I've seen it before. Right. But with the second part, I did feel that hint of romantic possibility between those two characters. And you're right, that may be betraying my biases somewhat. The same way that we don't have an equivalent shoujo culture in the States, we are also probably at least a little less prone to see these things as developing platonically. It's apples and oranges, I know, but is speed as satisfying after all they went through together if Keanu and Sandra Bullock end up things with a hearty hand clasp? <laughs> Definitely not to me. And I really did think that there was something that was developing here. Maybe that is a testament to me being an only child. I don't immediately go to sibling relationship in my mind when I think boy and girl. I think it's also a little bit difficult to put across 10-year-old as a very specific age. So I was definitely half expecting there to be some flash of romance. Okay, we're getting to my favorite part. Okay. Are you ready? That's the introduction of the stink spirit. <laughs> I love the stink spirit. So good. And Chihiro has her big tub assignment. She's got to clean this thing for this guy to come in. Is this what it was like for you working at Massage Envy, basically? Oh, my God. Yeah, we had people where we would internally discuss, is someone going to have a conversation with them to tell them they have to take a shower before they come? So were any of your customers actually a dragon with a thorn in their side at one point? Probably. But I didn't want to touch them that much. But I'll tell you about a time when I was a stink spirit. How about that? <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> I got to go to an onsen or a bathhouse when we went to Japan. I did this solo and I rode the train up the hill to get there. It was so beautiful. I'm so envious that you got to do this. Yeah. Screw you. Too bad. <laughs> you can go next time. But it was a beautiful experience. I got the finger wag because I unintentionally walked into a certain part of the floor with my shoes still on. I felt so badly about that. But I was taken care of from start to finish with the robe and the towels and the special shoes and the beautiful water and the landscape. And then I finished it up with udon with mountain vegetables. So eat your heart out over there. Yeah, I wish I could have gone. I felt fantastic afterwards. The stink was all gone. I'm delighted to say. Uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Okay, whatever. Well, as you mentioned, this is a stink spirit who was not actually a stink spirit. He gets saved because Chihiro is able to remove all the waste that he had been actually polluted with. And this comes directly from an experience Miyazaki had. He cleaned up a local river. And that's clearly, again, another theme that means so much to him, thinking of the environment and the natural world. Do you connect with this theme as well? Yes, I definitely do. And you're right. These ideas are inextricable from his films. This part of his body of work, it gives me such great comfort once all is said and done. There's often turmoil to get there, but the fact that those conditions are ultimately set right and nature is once again revered and protected and in balance. It always leaves me feeling more hopeful and peaceful than when I started the movie. It's not dissimilar from the monster or the killer being vanquished at the end of a horror film. At least for a moment or two, I feel like we can breathe a little easier. I'm starting to feel like the lazy Westerner again, because this is a bit of the same instance of the theme not quite striking me in the same way. I feel like I have been thinking about the environment for so long that I'm not disconnected from it. So then it's not quite as poignant. Does that make sense? Sure. If you're immersed in a thing for a long time, your whole life in our cases, conservation being a thing that we had drilled into us from my earliest memories. So if you're immersed in a thing, 
and you are appreciative of it and you understand the ins and outs of it, it is harder for it to be revelatory unless something completely outside the bounds of the normal happens. Give a hoot, don't pollute. I remember that from day one. Well, speaking of your lazy Western bias. <laughs> Sorry. My favorite scene occurs right about here. Chihiro is having a well-earned dumpling after this hard day's work. And I just feel such a real sense of satisfaction for her in that moment. I imagine that dumpling tastes better than any dumpling she's ever had. Same for the night's sleep that she's going to have. When you have that first experience where you feel like you've worked so hard and earned this thing, this simple pleasure really is the inverse of all of the collective greed and gluttony that we've seen in literally everyone else. It's such a nice counterpoint to all of that. I feel like it just brings everything in, settles everything down. She's sitting on that balcony, looking out over the water. It's just such a perfect scene. That's why I'm going to go get you a cookie after we finish recording. Because <laughs> you did a good job. We're betraying our biases again, maybe. You getting me a cookie instead of a dumpling. Maybe I'd rather have a dumpling. I don't know. I'd take a cookie, too. But we've talked about this before. Something I frequently think about with these films are the things that we just can't get. Things that we miss out on because we're not as well-versed in Eastern folklore, for example, or even something as fundamental as the language. There are some things that are literally lost in the translation here. There's poetry and ambiguity in some of the figures written on the buildings that could be taken more than one way. And then I have to think about the person who is doing the translation into English for either subtitles or dubbing, that they have to make one choice that might eliminate the nuances of other possibilities. And there's just no way that we can adequately convey how much is being communicated by the backgrounds in the opening section alone. One thing that I entirely missed, for example, that I only found by doing research, as Chihiro and her parents are walking through this abandoned food court, there are some signs up on which the symbols are reversed. Think the equivalent of seeing a diner with a sign that said doof instead of food. It would get your attention. It's one of those things that, if I was fluent in the language, would be giving me pause, like it does Chihiro. It would be that first inkling that we're in a dream state, that we might be through the looking glass. Something's off here. And Chihiro is then quite right to try to signal to everyone else, we shouldn't be here, we shouldn't be doing this. But because we don't know these things, we're just oblivious instead of slightly unsettled, which is a shame. We need a whole pop-up video yeah. episode for the film to show us, oh, that character means this, but it's a homophone for this, which gives you a totally different meaning. Yeah, and this is just one example among many. But on the flip side, this is one of the really fun things about reading about and studying film. Having the experience go beyond just the viewing. I love surprises like this when I dig into it more. And I'll pump for laziness here. You could still be lazy and you don't have to know that stuff. And it's still wonderful. You just take it up to 11 when you know some of the background. You're right. There are tons of things that you don't have to have any knowledge of the background to appreciate. Because all of these different elements and moods of the animation, they're doing so much. It's one of the things that appeals to me a great deal. You don't need a translator to understand the danger and intensity of Haku being chased by these paper birds. That's my absolute favorite single terrifying sequence. Yeah. And to grasp the gravity of his wounds and the importance of him getting medicine from this river spirit. You know exactly what's happening when his scales come off mid-flight. It's all so amazingly rendered. And then there are the more playful elements of that animation. This literally has a magic lantern in it, which I love. It's hopping down the road on its one foot. That character feels very Disney to me. You've got the mouse and the fly who are having so much fun the way they are. They don't want to go back to their previous physical manifestation. They're having such a great time on the train and then chasing each other. And then I love that little frog guy, Algeru. It is a true pleasure when this comic relief, it all actually works instead of being simply irritating. Well, Chihiro's gone on an important mission here. She's met Zeniba, who is Yubaba's twin sister. We've always got to have a twin here in some folklore. And Chihiro decides that she's going to leave no face with Zeniba, who will take care of him. Now, we've left the countryside at this point, this lovely little respite. We're back on the train to the bathhouse. We've seen so many different landscapes, so many different characters, so many different rituals. Do you think specifically our trip to Japan 
changed how we viewed the film? You certainly saw it before and after. Oh, yes, without a doubt. Everything we saw in Japan, so many beautiful shrines and Tori gates. I have a deeper appreciation for those details, I feel like, even if they're just a little thing in the background, now that we've experienced them in person. Is it different for you now that we've been there? You know, I didn't spend much time in the country or on a ton of trains. That onsen trip was the big highlight. I still do feel like I can smell the landscape. Do you know what I mean? Oh, that definitely. very specific mountainous. Trees. Oh, absolutely. So this seems even more familiar and lovely to me. One of the specific things that I feel that I didn't in viewings prior to traveling to Japan was the eeriness of some of these places being empty, specifically devoid of people. People are everywhere in Japan. And because of that, it went from, this is peaceful with nothing but the wind blowing through here to maybe a little bit of, things are maybe too quiet. But then I always revert back to preferring the quiet and the solitude. The walk up to the onsen from this little tiny train station, there was nobody around. It was just my footsteps. There were houses everywhere, but everything was closed on that day. But I guess I did have a little bit of that. Is somebody watching me from here? Did I get off in the wrong place? But everything was wonderful. And Chihiro is really growing. She's so much braver. She's helping Haku a little bit to the detriment of that plan to save her parents. And they've got this beautiful melancholy ride that's so quiet on the train back to the bathhouse. There's just so much life in each frame, but it's not frenetic. And that's on purpose, according to Miyazaki. He said, what my friends and I have been trying to do since the 1970s is to try and quiet things down a little bit. Don't just bombard them with noise and distraction. And to follow the path of children's emotions and feelings as we make a film. If you stay true to joy and astonishment and empathy, you don't have to have violence and you don't have to have action. They follow you. I love that sentiment. That's beautiful. I love this train in the water. It's so calm. It reminds me, actually not of Japan, but rather our train ride in Oslo from the airport to the center of the city. I was just amazed. No one said a word for an hour, two hours, however long we were on that train ride. But you were right. There was so much life all around, but everyone was either daydreaming or engaged in quiet contemplation. It was amazing. And this wasn't just single people on the train. This was still groups of people that were together, but nobody's, you know, yucking it up. You know me. I do really like, beyond the quiet aspect, I like the melancholy. I like the reflection in the mirror. So when we talk about the differences, the different types of animation, do you generally prefer a more chaotic approach, for lack of a better term? Or do you like this approach, leaving space and quiet within the story, which, by the way, is known as ma? It's just like the hand-drawn versus computer question, I think. Each story to its own devices. The earliest animated films I remember, those are Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies. Saturday morning cartoons. Bugs Bunny is pretty anarchic. And the Roadrunner is full of explosions and mayhem. And I love all that, but I do also love the contemplative as well. And there is a device here that I think Miyazaki uses to emphasize that better than anyone else. His attention to the sky is something special. It sets him apart from all other animators. These vast expanses of either sky and sometimes water, they are such a relief in a couple of ways. One, they're so beautifully rendered that you can't help but love to look at them. But even more important to me is the simplicity. They are a perfect contrast with those detail-rich environments like the bathhouse. They give your eye a chance to rest and so you can take a deep breath and then truly notice just how many great details there are to appreciate in the other parts of the film. Well, you know me, I don't mind having a cry, so the quiet appeals to me. Being an only child appeals to me. I didn't grow up with chaos. I didn't grow up with that constant noise from some source. So it really speaks to me. Now, here's something that I struggle with a little bit. This is, again, just me. There are two, to my mind, major refrains aimed at Chihiro. The first one is, you'll be all right. It's told to her several times. 
Now, I get why this is comforting. I get why sometimes I need to hear this as well. But I think the reverse of that is that it's often a way to just say, shut up. And I appreciate that she doesn't always take it as gospel. How do you feel about it? Well, I come from a long line of frontiersmen and outdoor types. That <laughs> our response is basically just rub some dirt in it and walk it off. So I definitely relate to that part of it. But I do see what you mean. But, another but, I also think that you and I, maybe we are betraying our biases again. It's the difference between having once been a kid, but not having any children ourselves. So we can remember the frustrations of being put off or feeling unfairly discounted and not feeling in charge of our own destiny because of our age at the time. But we have never experienced a kid asking the same question a thousand times and needing to come up with an answer that will just get them to knock it off and get on with it. Well, you didn't acknowledge it here, but I was saying that you're the person who tells me everything is going to be all right. <laughs> the second refrain, though, is undeniable. You will always feel better after you throw up. Oh, yeah. That is definitely true no matter what. Or in this house after you burp. That's mainly for the dogs. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> or you when you're no doing comment. your best Barney Gumble. <laughs> Sorry. But she's put up with all that and she's done all that. She's experienced all those things. She comes to her final test and she passes. I never doubted that she would. Again, speak for yourself. But I'm glad that everything was all right. So as the curtain's coming down here, I want to reemphasize the last moment of the film. I think it's also my final argument as to the irrelevance of computer versus hand-drawn animation in this particular case. Because that last gleam as the sunlight hits her hair tie gets me every time. It's this surprise little emotional grace note that I find so affecting. And the lump in my throat is not sitting there asking me, oh, do you think that was computer or hand-drawn? It doesn't matter. All that matters is that it happened, and it's magic. We first saw her in the back of the car. She's so vulnerable, and now she's full of life, and she's faced the whole world here. She's developed so much. Yeah, the whole thing is about Chihiro's journey, from petulant tween to resolutely overcoming her fears. And for me, the most important and moving part of her growth that I see here is that since she has arrived in this fantasy world... All her choices are in service of others. She has had to abandon that pouty selfishness that defined her character when we first met her. And that in itself is a huge achievement. But I think it's doubly difficult with the challenge never being very specifically outlined and not knowing what you have to do, where the finish line is, how to even solve this problem or even understanding what the problem is. So she just does her best and she faces everything head on. And I think she's at a unique disadvantage compared to a number of other Ghibli heroines because she is not inherently magical. She's surrounded by magical beings. Virtually everyone but her is magical. So her only superpower is her perseverance and her willingness to just forge ahead. She embraces every type of adventure and experience and she is rewarded with that growth. It is definitely a rite of passage that she goes through. There's no more hesitation at the end. She's making bold choices, tough choices too. You mentioned sometimes her parents will have to wait. Sacrifices will have to be made. Priorities will change, sometimes midstream. But her forthrightness and charity win the day. And I think I know I'm probably a little bit biased toward this one too, since these characteristics that she developed are things that I most admire. Hard work, confidence, steadfastness. But it's like you say, she is a completely different person when she exits that tunnel than the person she was when she went in. Now that's a 10-year-old other 10-year-olds can look up to. So let's circle back to something that we discussed in the beginning. As I mentioned, the film was specifically envisioned for 10-year-old girls. Now, we last chatted about the Muppets, and we talked about that fine line that can be walked successfully or not, between designing for both kids and adults. So do you feel like this film succeeds in its aim and still delights adults? Yes, and I think in a way that's kind of the polar opposite of the Muppets. I think it does go back to something that I mentioned just a minute ago. The divide doesn't fall along gender lines. It's much more generational. I think it succeeds by doing the opposite 
of those examples that we're talking about. Pixar, for instance, where there might be material for both kids and adults, but that are separate jokes. Instead, we are given one thing here to chew on, a series of miniature youth rebellions, and we are left to access that from either the kid side or the adult side or somewhere in between, depending on what's inside us. It's not two layers, it's not two levels, it's one thing for everyone. And as far as the other part goes, I know I'm only a portion of the audience. How do you imagine it plays for an audience of 10-year-old girls? Girls that haven't had a number of experiences like jobs, etc.? How do you think it plays to you when you're 10? I'm going back to something that you said just a moment ago about this whole idea that you don't know where the finish line is. You don't know what the goal is. I think, again, this plays well, especially to me and maybe other only children, because there's no one there to tell you what that finish line is. You can be in your own world. And at the same time, what I think is universal to kids in general is that especially when you don't have a lot of experience, everything that happens to you feels monumental. And I think that lets her voice be validated. She was right from start to finish. And at the same time, the folks who said, you'll be all right, they were right as well. There are just so many complex things happening here that it does something that Miyazaki talked about, that making a film specifically for children with a lot of devotion, can please adults. It doesn't always happen in the opposite direction. And speaking of that whole monumental aspect, the thing that still lives with me today, had I seen this as a kid, I would have been equally as stressed out, <laughs> wondering where it was going to go. Yeah, me being out of touch with being a 10-year-old, much less a young girl, it just had me wondering, is it just because I admire these qualities in her that I react so well to it, would it seem didactic if that was not your inclination? Because what if you're just a super lazy 10-year-old that doesn't want any part of having to grow and improve? Well, at least you get to see a dragon at the same time <laughs> and rub up against a radish. I mean, that's pretty cool. And he puts those lessons in the right mouths as well. Everybody has their place in furtherance of the story. Well, I started off talking about me having so little experience with animation and especially non-American animation. And I'm glad that I don't still shy away from it. I'm sorry that I did for so long. I think in general, I just didn't give these kinds of films enough credit. You know, there's a saying that Disney touches the heart, but Ghibli touches the soul. And so I had all of this Disney stuff that wasn't really speaking to me in the same way. I think that sentiment is totally true. I just didn't know animation was capable of doing that. Though, really, if I think back to my experience with Charlotte's Web as a kid, I should have known. But there were things that came to me as an adult, and that changed the complexion for me. These are things that I saw through you. Belladonna of Sadness, The Tale of Princess Kaguya that we covered on the show, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, even. So that just made the work of Ghibli make so much more sense to me. Well, I'm glad it's made such an impact. And I guess you don't feel that way anymore. We could just do a quick test. You don't even have to name them. But in your head, can you think of a list of your top 10 animated films? Quickly? It might still be a struggle, but I think that I could get there. I just named three mm. that made a huge difference. I'm about to mention another one for my recommendation. I think that I could get there. But they probably are newer discoveries rather than my childhood favorites. Well, something else that I thought about in terms of what might be a barrier for you as we're watching this, you're not usually the biggest fan of grotesquerie. How does that hit you here? Because compared to something like Kiki's Delivery Service, this is a parade of grotesques. You're right. And I really didn't think of it that way. It just manages to look so incredibly beautiful that I have no problem getting through it. I will say, if it were not animation, I'd probably be singing a different tune. I was thinking that what might be helping you in this case is that so much of it revolves around proportions, which is, I think, a great way for it to manifest itself. There are stink gods and parents turned into pigs, obviously, but there are just as many figures that appear fairly normal, aside from being hugely bloated or having an enormously outsized head, which you live with every day. <laughs> not, not me. I live with you right, having... Right enormous head. But it implies that there are horrors in the everyday if those things are disproportionately emphasized, maybe. So it wasn't just your standard grossness. 
It's not scatology, right. for example, which there's no way I could get through. The stink spirit and Jabba the Hutt are not the same thing. Okay, big question here. Is this, Spirited Away, the best animated film of all time? I'm asking that because it is considered such by many sources. Not to be a downer, but no, I don't think so. Don't get me wrong. This is a top-level, five-star experience. But even among just Miyazaki's films, there's at least one other that I think is better, Totoro, like I said at the beginning. But can you imagine your catalog being so deep that Spirited Away isn't your best work? My saying no to that question is basically just a testament to the phenomenal and enduring quality of his entire filmography. What do you think about it? I feel like I'm still sifting through so many of the greats, but I don't think it's the best. It's so incredibly wonderful that that's difficult to say, but you know I can never come down on one side or the other with that. Well, does that adequately wrap everything up here for you? Gosh, I hope so. Everybody sees Spirited Away for the first time or the 100th time right now. I do have one neat little thing that I want to mention before we go on to our recommendations. One neat thing I discovered was that most Studio Ghibli films were released in July, and that coincides with the preparations for Obon season, which is a Buddhist custom that lands somewhere between New Year's and Mexico's Day of the Dead. It's a celebration where everyone returns to their home places to honor the spirits of their ancestors in various ways. And one of my favorite elements of that, and it will be obvious why, are the beautiful lantern ceremonies that go along with it. And the atmosphere of this holiday seems to speak directly to Spirited Away in the sense that this is the time of year when all these familial spirits are roaming the countryside trying to get home. It's just such a beautiful image. We were lucky enough to be in Japan during cherry blossom season last time we went. The next time we go, we really should try to coordinate it with Obon season. I imagine it is beautiful. I'm in. You can go to the onsen with me this time. Well, how about something else beautiful and touching? You have a recommendation that I think is just going to be perfect. I think so. It's Kiki's Delivery Service, How Could I Not, from 1989, Written, produced, and directed by Hayao Miyazaki again, it's about a young witch, that's Kiki, who, as part of her rite of passage, moves to a new town and uses her flying ability to earn a living. It's joyful and fun and beautiful and stirring and very, very delightful. Everything I want. There are high stakes, managing important relationships, treating young people with respect, giving them the ability to make their way in life through important events without being unnecessarily harrowing, at least to my delicate sensibilities. Plus, it's a gorgeous European landscape throughout, and you know I like that. How about you? Well, I am going with another modern master of Japanese animation, and I have chosen Tokyo Godfathers from 2003, directed by Satoshi Kon, and starring Toru Emori, Yoshiaki Umigaki, and Aya Okamoto. It is about a makeshift family that have found each other living on the streets of Tokyo, and while rummaging through the trash on Christmas Eve, they discover an abandoned baby, and they set out to return the child to its family. Man, this one will put you through an emotional ringer, for sure, but it is so worth it. The animation style is just so rich and vibrant, the colors are beautiful, the story is an absolute roller coaster. You asked me earlier if I was worried about Sin's escape plan and how all that would turn out. This is one where you can never be truly sure about it until the credits roll. And it's a magnificent, if somewhat unconventional, Christmas story too, so I am happy to be able to recommend it during this time of year. If you are a fan of Japanese animation, you should not miss this or anything else that Satoshi Kon has ever made. So once again, that's two great recommendations, Kiki's Delivery Service and Tokyo Godfathers. And that brings us to the end of episode 147. First and foremost, we would like to say a special thank you to two new Patreon supporters this time around, Chad Parsons and Joanna Coelho. We appreciate that support very much. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magiclantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. 
If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter at lantern underscore cast. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Spencer Seams, Andy Wolverton, Laura Cannon at the Fatal Films Podcast, Leanne Kubich, Jay Finnick, The Fine Gentleman at Fuds on Film, Joseph Brown, The Cinema Renoir Film School, and Doug McCambridge at the Good Times Great Movies Podcast. If you are sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. You can find our show on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcasts you can find us. Thank you to the nice anonymous person that recently left us a five-star rating on iTunes. We appreciate that. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review any of those services, we would be very grateful. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. <laughs>